they are 12 games in most parts of the nation. That is that's amazing. Well, you know, any team that's got Nick Johnson. I love that guy. Yeah. I can't believe the Yankees got rid of him. That means we have to keep our mouths closed too, right? Good morning. We were very pleased to have General Conway with us today. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad to see your, your level of interest in our activities is diminishing. We appreciate that. We keep up the good work. We'll try and do the same. I don't have any opening statement. I'll, I'll, I, I will just acknowledge Secretary had a morning breakfast meeting with some members of Congress, a good discussion about a variety of issues here at the Pentagon. Uh, and he's sort of going about various meetings throughout the rest of the day. I've asked General Conway to join us today, and he'll give you a bit of an operational update, and we'll be happy to take a couple of questions. Are you, what, are you trying to ask a question now, Joe? No. Okay. Ask You're trying to get in there, but let's let General Conway talk first. Thank you, Larry. I'd like to talk just briefly about uh, Iraqi security forces this morning. Uh, they continue to grow their operational capabilities. Uh, we've talked about numbers of trained and equipped Iraqi security forces, and that number now is uh, just over 169,000. I want to emphasize, however, that training and equipping uh, are only part of the equation to building a capable and effective security force. You need to have strong leadership, effective command and control, operational capability, and simply put, experience. And that doesn't happen overnight. We have a plan for growing the force. We're on track with projections of numbers. Uh, we're partnering uh, our battalions with theirs, and our military transition teams are working with these units to enable them to operate independently. In fact, Iraqi troops, along with U.S. Uh, transition team members, led the operation to free Australian hostage Doug Wood. Uh, further on Tuesday, Iraqi and coalition forces captured another one of al-Qaeda's key leaders uh, in northern Iraq, the so-called Emir of Mosul, Abu Talha. Uh, so um, they're out there uh, making progress, gaining experience, and taking back their country from the insurgents. I'm confident that the trends are moving in the right direction, and with that, we'll take your questions. Larry, does, uh, does the Pentagon welcome a budding move from members of both parties in Congress to set a deadline for removing U.S. troops from Iraq as early as this year? Um, I think we've discussed this in some detail, and I'll let General Conway give a military perspective on these kinds of artificial deadlines, but it has been, I think, consistently the view that uh, since it's since the situation in Iraq uh, is, is developing along um, based on events in Iraq, it's difficult to establish a timeline for when U.S forces would no longer be needed in Iraq, and we've talked about the timeline that includes the political transition, the development of Iraqi security forces, and that's the, those are the principal elements that our presence is, is uh, geared to. So setting an artificial deadline, I think those who would wish to pick a deadline would find themselves, when that deadline arrived, um, either realizing that that was not a reasonable deadline or they got lucky and, it, and we, were, we may already be out by then. So it's just to, to pick a deadline or demand that a deadline be established, I think in addition to, as the President and others have talked about, encouraging insurgents to just wait us out, um, is, is not, I'm not sure anybody has sufficient knowledge to be able to pick the right deadline. We, we uh, are currently have U.S. forces in Bosnia with, our, with some allies uh, on a mission that had a deadline uh, that expired nine years ago. So we're, it's just deadlines don't work. 
I don't know if General I, you want. I think uh, it's fair to speak on behalf of the commanders and say that they would probably not welcome an artificially imposed deadline. Um, they have their plan. It's a plan for victory, uh, and forces will be withdrawn when, when victory is accomplished uh, b between U.S. and Iraqi forces. If you look at it from uh, the insurgents' perspective, uh, they know our history just like uh, we study them, and they see where we have withdrawn previously uh, in Vietnam, uh, in Beirut, uh, in Somalia. And nothing would make them happier, I suppose, than to think that uh, there is a deadline out there, there's a, there's a time and, and distance uh, factor associated with it, and then, as Larry said, they simply are able to wait us out. General Conway, can you uh, give us some details on the capture of Abu Talha and perhaps uh, the significance of that capture and the structure of uh, Zarqawi's network in Iraq? Um, he uh, was uh, known as the Emir of Mosul. Um, he is a, a key lieutenant in the al-Qaeda that has been established. Uh, he has said that he would not be taken alive, that uh, he wore uh, a vest and would detonate himself. In fact, he gave up rather peacefully uh, when U.S. Uh, and Iraqi forces uh, went to uh, actually an associate's house, and he happened to be there with a number of others. In terms of the impact, uh, we think it will be significant. Uh, he has been in charge of the operation up there for a long time. Mosul, as you know, uh, Brett, has, has become uh, more and more a focal point uh, for insurgent activities. So we have to think that the number two won't be as capable as he. Senator put out that he was some sort of operational uh, close aide to Zarqawi. I mean, is this on the scale of a Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and the big al-Qaeda? Is this, is this that significant operationally to Zarqawi's network? Uh, our belief is that Zarqawi has a number of key lieutenants in, in the various population centers around the Triangle, uh, and, and Talha uh, operates in, in that, in that uh, realm and in that capacity. General, if I could just uh, ask one more thing. Uh, the stream of suicide bombers, we've seen a number of them this week just walking into crowds, uh, and of course the car bombers have increased. Is there a thought about where they're coming from or how to stop the stream? Uh, and, and is in an endless stream, uh, it seems to increase in recent weeks. The intent of the insurgents is to create the spectacular attack. Uh, they have tried it against our base camps. It's failed. Uh, they are somewhat more successful against uh, Iraqi security forces who have the ability to defend themselves. Um, they are unfortunately able to succeed at an even greater rate against defenseless women and children forming in lines at the bank or, uh, or in the marketplace. Uh, we do think that there's a saturation point where the Iraqi people are simply going to stop standing for that, uh, and the byproduct of that will be more and more intelligence and tips on how to take these people down. Can I follow up on that, please? General, while, while the number of attacks in Iraq isn't necessarily the highest uh, that have been seen there since the insurgent war began, uh, they do appear to be uh, more effective, more lethal. Uh, could you tell us about the increased sophistication of the kind of devices they're using, the techniques, tactics, uh, and also what does that say about the increased sophistication of the enemy forces here? Are they getting, are they getting some guidance or help uh, from outside Iraq? I think it's, it's somewhat natural to expect over time that your enemy would observe you and your, your tactics uh, and, and develop counter tactics or approaches. We call them TTPs, techniques, uh, tactics, and procedures uh, that can be used against you. Uh, and, and so we're seeing some of that. Uh, he is learning how to uh, make his explosives uh, more effective uh, by combining different systems in them to give them more, uh, more, more blast effect, if you will. Uh, but again, I, I, think, I think the important factor here is, is who's being targeted. Uh, and the fact that uh, even though they have targeted the Iraqi security forces, we continue to see those young men in Iraq sign on in huge numbers uh, to join the Iraqi security forces, again, to take back their country. And we see that the people uh, are not being deterred or, or supportive of what they're seeing. In fact, they're very much reacting against it. Uh, so I, I, I have to think that, uh, that their, their, their technique and their tactic will in time fail. But also, uh, there's talk about the, the uh, insurgent forces now resorting to shape charges, yeah. which create a more powerfully directed black. Could you, mm -hmm. could you explain to us how that works? What is a shape charge, yeah. how it works? and how it's being used, uh, uh, and is it more effective against even an up-armored Humvee, for example? Yeah. Uh, we have seen instances in, in the recent past, I think probably uh, three uh, since the 1st of May, 
uh, where there has been a shape charge uh, type weapon uh, developed. Uh, it's, it's once again crude, uh, but, but in some ways effective. A uh, shape charge essentially uh, streams a, a jet, if you will, in this case with a projectile, with a base plate, uh, in a certain direction at a very rapid rate, uh, sufficient to penetrate uh, certain levels of armor. Even up-armored Humvees, for uh, Up-armored Humvees are susceptible if they're hit just right with the shape charge at just the right angle. Uh, we have lost uh, soldiers and or Marines uh, to, to some of these devices. And, and uh, the one question I ask, is there any indication that they are getting outside instruction, additional help from uh, more organized, sophisticated forces than you might find inside? Uh, Jim, I think the answer is not directly, at least to our knowledge. However, some of that uh, technology, if you want to call it that, is on the net. Let me just, if I can just follow up one point on a slightly different topic, but one area where we would welcome, Charlie, more congressional interest. To date, I think we've had something on the order of 11 senators, 77 members of the House, and 99 or 100 congressional staff members go visit Guantanamo. We would facilitate members going down to visit Guantanamo so that they would have a much better understanding of what's happening down there. And, it, and I think many of them, particularly those who have not been down there, would find that it's quite different from what they think is happening down there. So we, we would certainly welcome more members going down there and looking at it. We've facilitated that. Secretary has gone down with members of Congress. And, and we uh, comments that are being made up on Capitol Hill about what's happening at Guantanamo reflect a real ignorance of what's really going on down there. My follow-up to your follow-up. Sure. Would you, would is this you, authorized? <laughs> Where's the would, parliamentarian would, would, would around you here? Recommend members of Congress, as Senator Specter has suggested, um, uh, setting rules or criteria or whatever for holding uh, and treating uh, detainees in, in Guantanamo and elsewhere? It's a, it's, a, it's a very complicated question. It's one that we addressed with, with seriousness when the administration, when the President decided in February of 2002 to d make the decisions that were made at the time, which is that people who themselves violate the Geneva Conventions probably should not be recognized as, as, uh, as uh, combatants under the protections of the Geneva Conventions. Nonetheless, they were provided uh, uh, treatment consistent with the Geneva Principles and, and, uh, and certainly humane treatment. That's not the issue. The issue is what do we do about people in the world we're in now that claim no country, they move across borders easily. They wear no uniforms. They target civilians purposefully. Geneva was, pr was written so that that wouldn't happen. So the decision was made. And, and, and it is important that people can review that and understand it and draw their conclusions as to whether that was the right decision. The executive branch made that decision. Would you welcome the legislative branch entering the process and perhaps changing or? The or Congress uh, will, will act as, as Congress decides to act, and it's not our place to do that. What I will say, on behalf of the executive branch, we invite more members to go down to Guantanamo and see what's going on, because what's going on on there is not the way it's being described by certain members of Congress. And the way they are describing it is unfortunate, and in some places, I believe those people will regret having made those kinds of comments. Question for the general. General, earlier this week it was announced that a uh, man had been taken into custody. He was running sort of a suicide car factory or a shop where he was outfitting these vehicles. Um, I'm wondering, number one, do you have any indication that he was like a lone wolf? Was he part of a larger network? Have you gotten other information that would lead you to suspect that there were other places that you can then clamp down on? Uh, I, I've I've only read in the open source about the specific report that you cite, uh, but he is part of a chain, uh, and that chain begins with uh, with the the materiel uh, to create uh, the weapon, uh, the bomb maker. Uh, we think uh, which he is a part of that community is is a key. Uh, the British would say that uh, in in some cases maybe the most important aspect of the link. Uh, you then go to prevention uh, in in terms of how you avoid uh, the byproduct of, of his effort. And then you go to protection. Uh, and we're looking at all facets of that, uh, breaking that link, if you will, of, uh, of the IEDs or VB IEDs, uh, because it's, it's the, it is the most significant casualty maker in the country. Seventy percent of our, of our troops uh, are injured by virtue of IEDs or VB IEDs. Are you so, any further down the road oh, trying to clamp down on that at all? Well, we, uh, we continue to hammer away at it. Uh, and again, we, we focus on those people uh, that we think have that, that sort of key knowledge base to create these things. And, and we, we have their names, and, and we're trying to track them down. Joe. Uh, Larry, do you have any information about uh, those uh, arrested in Spain yesterday? And uh, they said that they are linked to uh, Zarqawi network? I don't. I don't. Um, I'm not, I haven't even heard the report, so I, I don't have any information on that. If we've got something, we'll be happy to provide it to you. Have we? on the people arrested in Spain that might be Al-Qaeda? 
Have we heard anything about it? I don't think we've released anything. I'll see if there's anything we can. If there is, we'll provide it. Uh, John. General, have you received any recommendations or are you receiving recommendations from the Iraq theater on force size, U.S. force size over the next 6, 12, 18 months? And are they more than 140 less? Sure. Uh, the, the commanders there, uh, General Vines, General Casey, General Abazid, uh, I, I think have that as a constant part of their site picture. And they're reviewing, uh, I would say, weekly uh, just what that force structure needs to be. Uh, the force structure is very much augmented uh, by the coming online of these additional Iraqi security forces that I spoke to you about earlier. Uh, and there are more forces being contributed to the fight, and, and they're wearing Iraqi Army uniforms. General, can I follow up on that? Um, Western Iraq and Anbar province, uh, there's been a number of report stories in recent weeks quoting Marine officers on the record saying, quite simply, there aren't enough troops in Anbar province to deal with the threat and to deal with the size of Anbar province and the territory. Um, and yet, from the podium, we hear all the time that there's plenty of U.S. troops in Iraq and that there's no shortage of, of troops. Can you explain a disconnect? I mean, are you hearing anything similar from, from Marines in the, pro in the Anbar province that, that they're just short men? No, frankly, I'm not. Uh, I've read some of the articles that you describe, and I suppose to the local commander, uh, you'd always like to be able to do more. And if you only had, you know, a few more helicopters or a few more tanks or a few more troops, you could probably do those things. So I suspect that's the genesis of, of what you're seeing, Mark. I do know that the commanders uh, in Baghdad are very uh, sensitive to those types of concerns. You've seen massing of forces where need be, I think, to, to get after some of the things that they discover. Uh, there have recently been some movement, uh, again, of Iraqi uh, army forces out to the border and out to the western region. So I think some of those concerns are, are being answered. Can I just follow, follow up and push back a little bit? Um, why would we not sort of listen to the guys on the ground who, who do say these things and, and, and do, you know, give these, these situation reports about what they're seeing? I mean, I'm not saying you're not listening to them, but I'm just wondering why wouldn't we take those very seriously? as a very you know, credible account of what's happening on the yeah, and, and, and I'm not saying that we're not taking him seriously. I'm simply saying that their perspective is that of as a lieutenant or a captain. Uh, it deals with their immediate surroundings and doesn't always take into account the large picture and some of the things that their commanders are doing to try to facilitate their concerns. And we've been there. We've been briefed by General Vines and then a subordinate division commander and they've had this very discussion about how uh, a region might decide, you know, from, as you described, a, a, a local commander might say, I, I need more, and they've described for us how, for the secretary, how they adjust to that. So I think they do listen to and take quite seriously uh, regional and local commanders who say, to, for the mission I'm assigned, you may need to shift some forces around, and that's what they try and do when that's the right answer. So I, I think I want to just make sure the premise is correct. They, I think local commanders have a way to say this is what they need, and, and, and that process is, is what it is, and it's, it's, it's how we are managing, how the commanders manage the problem in Iraq. Hey, Brian. Shifting gears a little bit, a little another bit. issue that's coming up in Congress, mm -hmm. uh, even with uh, members like Gilchrist and Ross Layton and now saying that maybe they were wrong in supporting Don't Ask, Don't Tell, uh, Service Lem Members Legal Defense Fund, a uh, uh, gay rights group, uh, has, is saying that the military since September 11th has been uh, discharging fewer and fewer and fewer uh, gays from the military. Uh, what's happening with, with that issue? Uh, why aren't you looking at uh, reviewing the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy and the administration's position on it, given the, 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 the need, the challenges that the Army and the Marines are facing? It, it's right now? The policy is the policy that everybody feels is the most effective for this, for this issue, which is not an easy issue, but no, the, the policy is not under review. It's not seen as something that would have – I don't think anybody believes it would have a significant impact on, the, on end strength. It's, a, it's, a, it's an important uh, policy that has been working, and uh, everybody's free to kind of express their views on whether they think it's the best policy, but it's the policy we've come up to, and, we're, and it's not under review that I'm it aware of. Okay, so it wouldn't have an impact positively on end strength. What would be the negative impact of the, the, the word that You know, the, the issue's been discussed and debated in, in both here in the, in, uh, in the, I would say, in the government as well as in the public for about 10 years now. I think the policy is 10 years old. So I think all the pros and cons have been well aired, and we are at a policy that I think when you kind of weigh everything together, people think is the right policy. Has the nation changed over the last 10 years, the perceptions and the, you know, the way people think about dealing with gays in society and dealing with them in the workplace? Hasn't that changed over the last decade? Uh, I, I, I suppose, but I, I guess where I come down is what I said, which is the policy uh, is frequently challenged, and we have frequently determined that that it's, remains the best policy. General Connolly, there was a newspaper report earlier this week that uh, quoted U.S. military officials in Iraq as, as speculating, conjecturing, whatever, 
that the increased number of suicide bombers in Iraq over the past couple of months may indicate a shift in, uh, uh, in the way the war is being fought in, uh, by the insurgent side and that it's becoming more of a, a religious jihad as opposed to an insurgency. Uh, is there any intelligence or any indication from commanders on the ground that uh, that's, that's an increasing concern in Iraq? I have not seen that officially registered, Jim. Jim, can I follow on that? The uh, enemy in the past has always been the former regime loyalists and jihadists, mm -hmm. but they, they seem to be mutually exclusive. Are you seeing any falling out between those two uh, groups? Um, we have seen some some evidence of that. There are there are disparate reports. Uh, I don't know that we would call it Finnish intelligence at this point. But the issue is is what I described earlier, that is the people are, are getting fed up uh, with the attacks on civilians, and even the insurgent groups are are warring amongst themselves over this continual slaughter of Iraqis. So there is some fragmentation that we're seeing. And the emerging Iraqi government is trying to bring. Uh, people who were not part of the political process to this point into that process, and that's going to necessarily peel off some of those people, I suppose. Yes, right here. Um, United States and South Korea have a joint military operation plane 5029 in case of uh, emergency happening in Korean Peninsula. On the contrary, South Korean government is known to unilaterally change the operation plane. What is your comment? My comment is that we don't discuss military operational planning. It's uh, Korea is a uh, important ally of the United States, and we have all of the appropriate interaction with the Korean government that we need, but we don't discuss uh, specific operational okay. plans. Tony. Can I get back to the issue of a deadline? And General, you paint the picture of an enemy that could wait us out, lessons of Vietnam, Lebanon, Somalia. What is the current definition of victory among the commanders over there? I, just paint this picture of the, they can absorb whatever punishment we take. If we have a deadline, they can wait us out. What should the American public expect now? What's the latest definition from the eyes of the commanders that you touch base with of, of victory over there? Well, we can leave at some point. Let me start on that and he can give you a military perspective because it isn't just a military solution. It's, uh, you know, that we've from the beginning laid out, the president has laid out some some objectives with respect to Iraq and its transition. He's talked about the transfer of sovereignty, which happened. It happened almost one year ago, and since then a great deal of political development, which was another objective. In other words, transfer sovereignty to the Iraqi government and then let that Iraqi government start developing, which it's doing. It has had several major milestones of electoral act actions. It'll have more going forward, and they're scheduled. And there's a constitution or a law that allows for that. Greater involvement by the international community. That's happening. NATO has a training mission in Iraq. The coalition remains more or less about where it is with 30 plus or minus countries involved. Uh, continued effort in the reconstruction of Iraq, and that's happening. We're, we've probably uh, expended or at least obligated to expend, I would say, something south of $10 billion and heading for, further. Uh, uh, and then the development of the Iraqi security forces. So there's, there's no military definition of success, the definition of success is, is those things. The Iraqi government taking responsibility for its own decisions, which it's increasingly doing. Uh, reconstruction continuing, which is going on. Uh, sovereignty has already occurred. So th those things will happen. And then as a component of that, military commanders will assess how much can Iraqi security forces take responsibility for. And that's happening. And I think that's an area where General Conway may have his thoughts. Yeah, you know, the, the actual mission, uh, I, I suppose, is classified. But I can paraphrase it to say that uh, a, a safe and secure Iraq that we are able to turn back over to the Iraqis. Uh, the commander has multiple lines of operations, uh, not, not just security, but they're economic. Uh, there, are, there are laws. There are governmental. Uh, all those things are working. They're being continually reevaluated, not just by U.S., but by U.S. and our Iraqi partners. Uh, and when the Iraqis feel like that uh, they're able to, to take the reins completely, uh, then I think uh, we'll be looking at, uh, at the V-word. It's not very amorphous, though. It's, it but it's, like it's not amorphous. It was amorphous when people asked the question on May 1st of 2003. It was amorphous when they asked it on August 1st. And which this, the questions haven't changed, but the, the progress has been notable. And there's nothing amorphous about the, the election of an Iraqi government, the election of a national assembly, the passage of a transitional law, the development of 165,000 security forces. That's real, and right, and, and that is. But but keep in mind, look at it from the terrorist perspective. They are doing all these attacks, and yet, transitional administrative law, transition of sovereignty, 165,000 Iraqi security forces. So if you're looking at it from the terrorist perspective and saying, 
what do we have to do? These people aren't stopping. They're moving forward, and they're going to take control of this country, and they're going to have their own security forces. So I, I just turn the question back around. If you asked this question on May 1, 2003, what's the progress? And we said, well, in, at a certain point in time, we want to have the Iraqis have their own sovereignty. We want to have 165,000 security forces. It would have been fair at that point to say, well, how the heck do you get there? But now we're there. And, and so... But, but the, one thing, the one thing that you leave Hold out on. Of, we'll get back to you. Go ahead. What do you General, got? But you said safe and secure. That's the definition of part of the mission. How do you define that, though? Is it when attacks go from 50 to 60 a day to zero or to less than 10? I mean, can you give us a better sense of what that means, safe and secure? It, uh, there are metrics associated with it. Um, and, and again, I, I think we'll know it when we see it. Uh, when, when the Iraqi security forces feel like that, uh, that the, it has transitioned from a, a military solution to a police solution uh, and the local police can resolve their problems at the local level, uh, then I think, uh, I think the Iraqi security forces will feel like that the handoff is, is somewhat complete. Okay, Ben. Well, in the one context that we haven't, I haven't heard discussed in regarding a timetable for withdrawal and arrest is the effect of a deteriorating support in the United States for the military operation. Now, let me ask you to comment on that, if you could, please. Uh, it's an important consideration. Obviously, the, the public support of, of, of these kinds of operations is critical, which is why we spend enough, a, a lot of time trying to make sure that the public has full access to all the information. Uh, I think that the public recognizes that this is, is, uh, a, has been a challenge, that the President uh, has laid out some objectives. It's important to always remind people how we're doing against those objectives, and I think we'll see more of that as we get closer to the transition date to remind people that, you know, a year ago this happened. It's, it's a, it, it is important. I, I don't want to discount it. I, I, you know, the polls move up and down. They go a lot of different directions. I think when people are uh, here every day that it's terrible in Iraq because a bomb went off, they, they wonder, um, geez, maybe it's terrible in Iraq, a bomb went off. If you look at one indicator, uh, the people who are there and know the most, the, the Americans who are in Iraq and know the most about Iraq are our military. And in numbers we've probably not seen, maybe in my lifetime, they're, they're recruit, they're uh, re-enlisting 200% uh, uh, a goal, 150% a goal for units that have deployed to Iraq. So those individuals who are the most knowledgeable Americans of all think, geez, it's something worth doing. Now, I know that does not translate to public support, but it's not a bad indicator of what's really going on in Iraq as opposed to what people sort of had the perception. Then it is our challenge to make sure that that perception is as broad as possible. Well, I also comment tax on that. Free, they're getting taxes uh, free. I made you also to, to re-enlist, too, in Iraq. Let me, we'll get back to it. Let the general. If your position is, if your belief is that the only reason our, our soldiers are re-enlisting is because they're getting tax-free uh, of reason. course we offer incentives, there's no question, yeah. but, but it's, it's, it, when you talk to them, their, their answers are manifold. It, they, they do get better pay and incentives. They also feel like what they're doing is very important and that it's making a difference and that they're keeping America secure. So it's a, it's a range of things. Yeah. Did you want to finish I up on that? I ask you in your comments to talk about what you spoke of earlier, which was Vietnam, for instance, uh, which was, I think we'll all agree, affected by public opinion in, in the United yeah, States. Uh, there's, a, there's a story that goes back to Vietnam I'll, I'll use to start off with. It was a story of a Marine colonel talking to a Vietnamese colonel, and the Marine said to him, we beat you every time on the battlefield. And the Vietnamese colonel said, that is true, but it's also irrelevant. Uh, and the fact is, they realize what I think our contemporary enemy realizes, that American public opinion is the center of gravity, that a democracy can't do certain things if, in fact, the citizens don't support it. So it, it is concerning uh, that our, our, our public uh, uh, is not as supportive as perhaps they once would uh, were. We, we'd like, uh, I believe, to try to reverse those figures and, and start to trend back the other direction because it's extremely important to the, the soldier and the Marine, the airman and the sailor over there to know that their country's behind them. Uh, we believe that this, go this global war on terrorism is not going to be ended necessarily uh, with Iraq and Afghanistan. So, uh, and, and we didn't start this fight. So I don't know that it's our option to simply withdraw at this point uh, until such time as, as this whole concept of the global war on terrorism is done. But, but it's Aren't an, you under some pressure well, to turn we'll it we'll around? We'll get to you. Get to you. We're going to get to everybody here. Don't, please don't just blur out questions. It's, it's – um, it's an important one, and it's an important factor, and, and that's why government officials and military officers and others spend a lot of time trying to interact and understand and let 
uh, the public understand what's happening there because public support is obviously very important for these kinds of actions. Pam. I have a question for each of you. General, could you give us an update on Afghanistan? Anecdotally, it seems to be getting um, worse, and may, it seems as though they're adopting some tactics that are successful in Iraq. And Larry, could you talk um, about the defense counsels for the Guantanamo detainees? Uh, it came out yesterday at the hearing. Lieutenant Commander Smith said that the office is going down from six attorneys full-time to one attorney full-time. And while I know that each of the attorneys that are assigned to defend detainees maintain that account, they're also having uh, – they have other jobs now to do. And so a, a, a cynical person could look at that and say that the Defense Department is now sort of taking away the, the one advocate that the Guantanamo detainees do have um, in, in military commissions. And, and those lawyers have, have actually been quite critical of them, the whole military commission system. Yeah, the so how is it? In, in, I'll answer that and we'll let General uh, Conway talk to Afghanistan. The, the Office of Military Commissions is up. It's operating. We've published the uh, the commission regulations and the various commission papers uh, widely. The rules are exist. We've had one or two proceedings under the military commissions. Uh, the defense attorneys, as part of the military commissions, will mount a vigorous defense for their clients, as they should. And part of their vigorous defense appears to be to challenge the, the uh, legitimacy of military commissions, and that's their right to do that. It, uh, we believe that the military commission's process is one that has is based in precedent that will be capable of, of providing an important process to to kind of come to closure on, on detainees. It is under review by uh, a, dis a circuit court right now, and once that review is complete, we believe we'll be able to move forward and that detainees will have the full rights that they're being provided by the military commissions when that happens. Get though, if their lawyers who were once full time assigned to that job are now, now well, we'll wait and jobs. see. When there's military commissions, I think everybody will have the opportunity to evaluate for themselves. In addition to military commissions, though, let me remind you, there's a combatant status review tribunal where a, where a detainee is allowed to have representation, and ha and we've most of those combatant status review tribunals, many of them, I should say, have been open. Uh, NGOs have part have observed, some press have observed. That there's administrative. It need not be by lawyers. Uh, there's, there's, uh, it's an administrative process. There's, uh, there's administrative review boards where detainees will have uh, the opportunity to have their cases reviewed each year. Uh, there, there's a lot of process, review process in place, and there is a process in place that, that is tested by history, known as the military commissions, and we're confident that it will survive challenge and that it will be seen as something fair and appropriate to this unusual situation we find ourselves in. Understand why that office is being reduced from six to one full time? Uh, offhand, I don't know. Well, if there's a if there's a reasonable answer we can provide you, we'll try to, it, Brian. Um, but it's it's as I said, the time will tell if people if people will have the opportunity to evaluate for themselves. Uh, in addition, by the way, the Supreme Court allowed for habeas uh, appeals, and there are now I think some 200 uh, detainees that are represented by attorneys in that venue too. So th there's a very transparent review process going on down in Guantanamo, and and those detainees are going to get a lot more rights than the people they, they were involved in killing. Afghanistan? Uh, you know, I, I think our intelligence experts would say that there's not much that's happened in, in, in the last couple of months that wasn't anticipated. The bad guys have come down out of the mountains after a harsh winter. Uh, attacks are still averaging less than three a day. Um, the, uh, the turnover, uh, is stage two turnover to NATO forces uh, is complete as of 31 May, so they now uh, command and control the, the northern and, and now the western portions of the country. Another large chunk up against the Pakistani borders being looked at as, as stage three. Uh, so uh, the, the expansion of the, uh, the Afghan National Army is, is again happening according to uh, the timeline that's been laid out by the commanders there. So I think uh, we're, we're quite pleased, in fact, with developments. We may have time for one or two more follow-up. Uh, follow Their statement uh, from the outgoing uh, envoy to Afghanistan that Osama bin Laden and Mullah Omar are no longer in Afghanistan. Uh, is that your best information, and and should and does that mean they're in Pakistan, or have they gone somewhere else? Oh, um, probably shouldn't talk about that uh, in an open forum. Well, and I'm not sure. <laughs> well, I would say in an open forum, who knows? Uh, so <laughs> if you've got something better in a closed forum, I'd be happy to hear it. But there's Afghanistan, and then 200 other countries in the world. So I'm not sure that because Afghanistan no means Pakistan yes. I, I as Al, I guess gave his views on it. Uh, Believe yeah, that Osama bin Laden and Mullah Muhammad Omar are not are not in Afghanistan, and I think there are other people who believe that. But we've talked a lot about this. When we when we've got them, we've got them. Will 
Yeah, and then on we'll get the back to defense, the U.S. defense sales to Israel, um, is it the U.S. policy now not to move forward <coughs> with any uh, defense sales to Israel until the dispute over Israel's sales to uh, China uh, is resolved? I don't think it's quite that sweeping. We have some restrictions within the Joint Strike Fighter Program that we've discussed, and I think we've provided some detail on that. Uh, and it's mostly restrictions on technology going forward in that program. And I think, uh, in fact, I saw an interview that General Kohler gave on this issue. Uh, that you might want to take a look at. General Kohler is the head of the Defense Security Cooperation Agency where he talked a little bit about this. Uh, but it's, I don't believe that it's, and, and Brian will either correct me or we'll provide additional information, it's not a across-the-board uh, policy. It's, it's with respect to the Joint Strike Fighter, we have some tech transfer issues that we're working with the Israeli government on that we've talked a little bit about, and I'll try and provide some more detail. So it's not a uniform freeze, but it's a case-by-case -case basis? It's a, it's a it's a policy that's right now, at the moment, as I understand it, focused on the Joint Strike Fighter and technology involved in that program. Whether you're under an exit deadline or not, because of the importance of public opinion, aren't you, a, in fact, under a kind of time pressure to turn things around in Iraq? Again, I guess it just goes based, it's based on what people determines what turning around is. There's, what, what we believe we're under is uh, the timetable established by the transitional administrative law to transfer full uh, control to the Iraqi government, and that timetable has been well established. That timetable is being worked against. Uh, there have been periods where uh, some of the uh, the nature of the attacks have spiked. We saw a period uh, in that summer, fall of '03, I guess it was, where it was the question sounded a lot similar to what we're hearing now, and I understand that because it was a tough time. We had a couple of aircraft shot down, helicopters. We had the Karbala bombing that killed 180 people, if my memory serves me correctly, the U.N. bombing. Um, and yet through all of that, uh, people would have said, and I think did at that time, when are you going to turn things around in Iraq? And we've since then had a new government, actually two governments since then, the transitional government and now this government, the interim government. We have, we've had the um, elections of the National Assembly. I mean, the progress is inexorable. We hope it continues in this way, and it's, we believe it will. There's no reason, there's better reason to believe that it will than won't, and in the meantime, we're going to have to deal with these obvious challenges, and nobody's trying to put a happy face on it. They are challenges. Why aren't polls reflecting that, though? I, I, look, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, um, uh, Americans, I think, genetically speaking, are impatient people, and I understand that. I respect that. I, uh, people, people want to see things happen. Right now, we're living in an age where um, it's, it's um, 24-7 news coverage. We've talked a lot about this. They're being inundated every day with images that are negative, and, and, and they rightly react by saying, geez, if it's so bad over there, uh, you know, is there any hope for the future? And our job is to keep reminding people that the future is, is one that is a very different future for 50 million people who have been liberated by U.S. forces and other coalition allies, and one that there has been significant, notable progress. And uh, I think, oh, I didn't say that. No, did I say that? Well, you said, you know, 24-7 news coverage, people are being inundated with bad news. I mean, people are talking to us from the U.S. government, from right. the U.S. military, are telling us these things that we're reporting. We're not uh, making them up out of thin air. Nonetheless, my statement is equally valid, which is 24-7 news coverage of car bombs. And that is, tends to leave a certain impression. And, and I'm not challenging it. I'm simply stating it as a fact. And so our job is to make sure that there are all other perspectives that are available. We try our best to provide those perspectives. And as I said, over time, I think the American public's judgment is a good one, and the American public will judge that this cause, I believe, that this cause was a worthwhile cause, that it was one that they're proud of, and they'll look back on it feeling very good about what, what, what this country and what our allies accomplished in both those countries, together with those countries. I think that's about it. Thanks very much, folks.